We are really thrilled that you join us in the change and the humanitarian change. Um, is a new child project which we've just started and uh, which my colleague Andrea will elaborate on in a minute. The second reason has been that this project and event is one of the first fruits of our European network project, which um, some of you might have heard about. Uh, this project for which we will host um, tomorrow a series of think tank colleagues from Europe and uh, other countries here in Berlin aims in cooperation with the German Foreign Office at extending um, cooperation, networking, to ensure principal humanitarian action and uh, humanitarian space to be protected in very challenging times. When we started this project, of course, we did not expect the terrifying way and it will be demonstrated in due course at the heart of Europe, how much better European cooperation is needed on all levels and how humanitarian challenges uh, will escalate as a higher group. Many of us have colleagues and friends um, in the affected regions, and of course, so we discuss today a different topic, um, our hearts and minds um, will be with me. Well, of course, our small European project um, cannot help much um, in this current crisis. In its light, we are even more happy to have such high-level and distinguished guests from European partner countries um, today and tomorrow uh, in Berlin. For a start, the director of IML is say, uh, the leading think tank in the European Union on development and humanitarian affairs. And I might say the brain of humanitarian debate and the former humanitarian spiritus rector of Alma uh, will be with us, who's working for so many years on humanitarian change and these days on climate change and humanitarian change. So, after putting enough pressure on our panel, I'm happy to hand over now to my colleague Andrea, who will be your host today. So, we're on the show and the camera is moving, hopefully, and please enjoy. Thank you so much, Ralf. Also from my side, uh, a warm welcome to everyone joining online and to everyone here in the room with us. My name is um, Andrea Steinke. I'm a research fellow at the Center for Humanitarian Action and I'm going to facilitate today's event. Um, it is uh, jointly hosted by Cha and uh, Dale. Cha, as uh, Ralf has already mentioned, is a think tank in Germany founded in um, 2018 by Caritas Germany, with him at Médecins Sans Frontières, and we are dedicated to all things humanitarian and trying to bridge the gap between um, research and practice and policy and operations. Um, Erwe, on the other hand, is uh, this event's co-host, is an independent think tank founded in uh, 1993, um, has been around uh, a lot longer than we have, um, and specializes in analyzing practices and developing, po developing policies for the humanitarian sector. It's uh, multidisciplinary expertise based on continual feed visits to crisis and post-crisis contexts, provides insights into the functioning of the humanitarian sector at Group URB um, believes in sharing knowledge and collective learning, which is very important, uh, I might add, and help aid actors improve the quality of their programs. We are very happy to have you here and um, looking forward to um, discussing um, today's topic. Um, the stakes for our planet have never been higher, stated the chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPPC Working Group, during the launch of yesterday's um, uh, yesterday's launch of, of the report. So uh, this statement, this was just the um, initial statement and it was followed by a series of very, very alarming uh, facts and figures at uh, the bleakest warning yet in summary. Um, we here at the Center for Humanitarian Action care for the humanitarian side of things. So our focus is on the effects of climate change on humanitarian action. While it certainly has influenced our earlier works on topics such as the humanitarian development and peace nexus and the German humanitarian engagement, for example, as of 2022, we have made uh, climate change and humanitarian change one of our thematic priorities. Um, in addition to the numerous plant conflicts all over the world, climate change currently poses um, the greatest challenge to the already overburdened uh, humanitarian system in operational and programmatic as well as in normative terms. Anticipatory, preventive and sustainable action is increasingly becoming a prerequisite for humanitarian actors to be capable and accepted um, in, this, in this field. 
Our own project aims to analyze the impact of climate change on the humanitarian system and in particular on um, norms, mandates and practices of humanitarian action. On the one hand, we want to look um, at that in terms of existing and increasing challenges. And on the other hand, in order to actually identify opportunities to address current systemic issues and the related possibilities for um, change and reorientation. So today's event is supposed to kickstart this initiative and our own engagement with the topic and can be seen as taking stock, discussing and uh, actually listening to other actors' experiences and perspectives on the topic. So um, I as well am very happy to welcome today's speaker again, uh, Leonie Dujafre and Bernox uh, Clark. We are very, very happy and delighted to have you here in Berlin, both, uh, both of you with us um, for this, actually one of the first um, collective collaborative um, on-site events we have had uh, in the past three years. Um, I will give each of you a proper introduction once it's your uh, um, first time to speak. We are also joined by uh, two other uh, very distinguished guests, Corinna Kreidler and Ton Hoyser, uh, who are in town just for this um, other um, network meeting tomorrow. Um, and last but not least, obviously, uh, I'm very happy, we are very happy to be joined by such a distinguished online audience. I looked at the registration yesterday and it's quite impressive and I'm, I'm very happy that we have uh, managed to attract um, uh, interest from diverse institutions and diverse backgrounds. Thank you, thank you so much for coming online to this event, particularly in this very sometimes. Um, I know all of you have probably a lot of you played in personal and professional terms and um, Thank you so much for making the time anyway. Um, to give you a short sense of direction of what you have to expect, this event is kind of uh, split in three parts. First of all, uh, Paul and Veronique will give us a short introduction into their thoughts and topics. Um, then I will open up the, the panel to uh, the on-site audience, invite Ton and uh, Corinna to, to join us here. Uh, for the discussion and then the third part the last 30 minutes will be dedicated to um, the audience questions and uh, discussions as you might have noticed um, we have decided to uh, choose a zoom format that uh, allows for active participation so uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes um, please um, Turn your uh, camera off and uh, mute yourself when you are not uh, um, when it's not your time to speak to allow for a, a smooth event. Also, please bear with us. It's um, the first time that we actually host this kind of format event without uh, the support of an external streaming provider. Uh, our team is doing um, their best, and I'm very hopeful and very uh, positive that we will have a smooth event. But if there are a small technical glitch, please bear with us. With us. Um, for the ultimate uh, best viewing experience, I uh, was told it's best to pitch Studio One and Studio Two in your own private um, um, Zoom browser. If you have any technical questions, please uh, contact the user uh, char technical support. If you have questions and comments for the panel, uh, please post them in the chat. Um, if you're keen on joining us uh, by camera in the uh, third part of the event, please pose your questions and um, indicate that you want to uh, go online. Ralf is going to monitor the chat and give us a brief uh, uh, insight uh, in the event. Um, as a little warm up to audience participation, we would like to interest you in a poll. Um, we would like to hear your opinion on the statement that builds the foundation of today's event. Um, climate change is a game changer for humanitarian action. Do you agree or would you rather disagree? Please um, express your opinion now. Time for a drink. Yes. So I guess it's quite obvious that uh, more than 90% uh, are in strong uh, or agreement on, on this um, um, a statement and um, it is also um, what the prelim preliminary assessment of humanitarian organizations of the IP IPCC report yesterday um, indicated. So I think we are well set for uh, 
directly diving into today's um, topics. So let's get started with Paul. Paul Knox Clark is a principal at the ADAPT initiative. He has worked in humanitarian action for most of his career. He held a number of positions in country programs and at headquarters of um, Save the Children UK and the World Food Program and worked as a head of research for the ALNAP uh, Humanitarian Network, where he was lead author for the state of the humanitarian system report. Paul is an expert in the dynamics of international organizations and in system and organizational change. And uh, I'm very happy that you're here. Please give us up with some ideas and conclusions of the ADAPT report. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm very, very happy to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's, uh, it's actually lovely, marvelous to be in a room with people. Yes. Um, and thank you so much, everybody, for, for uh, putting some time into, into joining us today. Um, so I would have uh, strongly agreed to that statement. Um, let me explain why, because I think, I think um, none of us know the situation that we're moving into. None of us actually, we can perhaps look at the broad outlines of the situation that we're moving into, helped by the IPCC report on impact yesterday. But, you know, there are many, many questions open. So here is, here is an argument, do, what, do with it what you will. I would suggest that the, the world is now facing a tidal wave of disasters and crises uh, for which we're not yet prepared. Um, part of this is because we are looking down the barrel of many more and many more widespread and impactful disasters as a result of climate change. So part of this is about scale. Yeah? We can confidently expect that there will be more disasters, there will be larger disasters, there will be more widespread um, as a result of climate change. We can also expect um, that there will be, uh, on top of the very large levels of migration that we're already seeing, distress migration we're already seeing globally, there will be larger distress migration to which climate change will be a significant contributing factor. And whilst we can't say that I think that climate change causes conflict, I think this, the, the jury is out on that, we can say that in those areas where conflict is already occurring, um, climate change makes the reality, the experience of people already living in those environments much, much worse, much harder. So taking these three elements together, we're looking at many, many more people who will be affected by crises and disasters globally. Now, if that was the only problem, and it's a big enough problem, perhaps we would not be looking at a game changer. Perhaps it would just be a, a situation where we're looking at the same basic profile, but bigger, and we do the same things, but more of them and more often. The reason that it's a game changer, I think, is this. Not only is this a question of scale, it's also a question of the nature of the crises which the world is facing. Firstly, we are moving out of the, the, the environment which all humanity, all recorded humanity has been in, into a situation where we do not understand how the environment works. Things are going to become, crises are going to become much less predictable. And that means that our ways of responding to them may not work. Secondly, uh, we can expect to see new kinds of humanitarian crisis, which we're not new uh, in terms of the humanitarian system has not necessarily responded to them in the past. Things like uh, dam bursts, things like wildfires uh, affecting urban areas, uh, things like heat events. Um, which we are very quickly going to have to learn how to respond to. And thirdly, we can expect, and this is, comes out very much in the IPCC report, uh, cascading crises, complex crises, crises that run out of control. So a game changer, because it's not just more, it's different. And if we can go to the next slide, because we will be addressing it in a different context. Um, where a city has been um, fl flooded, a large coastal city has been flooded. This is a situation which we will get have to get increasingly used to 
And we'll find that many of the things that we require, the IT, the ports, the, the, the humanitarian playbook requires, um, will not be available to us. And how will we work there? We've had a taste of this with COVID. What uh, Francois of Group URD calls the degraded environments of climate response. Secondly, we will be working in a situation where the military uh, globally are becoming much more interested. Uh, the space, the humanitarian space around climate change will be securitized. Militaries will be much more involved. How are we going to maintain humanitarian principles? Thirdly, as we've seen, sadly, with COVID, where things are hitting us at home, uh, the public appetite and governmental appetite to provide support overseas can decrease. So we can get a me first uh, response to these crises. And I think, sadly, we, can perhaps, we should perhaps plan for that as Northern countries are increasingly impacted by climate change, perhaps the attention given to the global South will decline. So yes, I think it's a game changer. If we could go on, please. Are we ready for the game to change? Um, broadly speaking, um, probably not. Uh, the awareness around the nature, scale, size, type of crisis is very uneven, I think, across the humanitarian sector and across the disaster management sector more globally. Some countries, some organisations are really at the top of their game on this. They've been working on it for decades. Um, many of us have come to it much, much later and have a lot to learn. Um, and before we learn, we have to recognise that this is going to be the centre of much, not all, but much of our work uh, in the years to come. Secondly, even where that awareness exists, what we do about it, programmatic response, is we're not clear, I think. It's not clear what the relative and how we put together uh, mitigation work, uh, anticipation, preparedness, response, um, and resilience work. How do we put all these... How do we work across this spectrum? What do I in an organization do? And thirdly, within the humanitarian system and beyond the humanitarian system, we're in a situation of very strong silos, which don't necessarily work for climate, which is an issue for development and humanitarian. The money, the climate money, the humanitarian money, and the developmental money is very strongly siloed. Um, we need to break these silos down. Our ways of thinking, which worked very, very well for the 1980s, perhaps are not going to work very well for the 2020s and beyond. Finally, the silos are also vertical, as we know from, the, from many discussions. None of this, or very little of this money, not just the humanitarian money, but also the climate money and to a degree the development money, is actually getting to the frontline actors who need it the most and who actually at the moment have by far the most experience in responding to the crises of climate change. So I think a huge challenge is coming for all of us and professionally a huge challenge is coming for us and sadly we are not yet ready for it. Thank you so much, Paul. We will um, just uh, jump right next to uh, Veronique to then um, have a discussion among the three of us. Uh, Veronique Jaffray is uh, Executive Director of uh, Le Group Urgence Rehabilitation et Développement, a French think tank, um, and today's call as uh, we have already elaborated. She oversees the uh, research, evaluation, and training team at URD, and she also designs and carries out projects herself, particularly concerning the effectiveness of F8 and the interaction between actors within the humanitarian system. Since 2012, she has coordinated the INSPIRE um, Consortium, which provides DG ECHO with support in developing and disseminating its humanitarian policies. She participated in the development of the core humanitarian standard and is currently a member of its management group together with SPHERE and SPHERE's and CHS Alliance directors. Um, she coordinated also the latest INAP lessons paper, adapting humanitarian aid to the effects of climate change. Uh, Veronique, thank you so much for being here. I'm very excited and thrilled. Um, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to Chan for the invitation. It's, uh, I think, a very relevant topic uh, nowadays. 
and um, I'm happy to, to present uh, a complementary uh, perspective on the same issue. Um, let's say the, we are talking about uh, two uh, faces of the same coins when talking about uh, adaptation of the humanitarian system to the effect of climate change and bringing the aid uh, or uh, making sure that uh, aid is uh, uh, sensitive to climate and environmental issues. So to start with, um, I would say that um, we all know that disasters are not uh, natural, of course. They are the result of uh, development models and the way of lives uh, that we all um, um, take part. Uh, so um, there is a, a, a question right now around those uh, development models. And, uh, and we all know that changes, changing this is indeed very complex. We, we know it as citizens, as individuals, but also part of a system. Uh, once can say it's too huge, too global, uh, too technical, and uh, should be dealt with at the macro level. Um, but um, the, the main uh, tragedy of, uh, of, the, of this uh, response to climate crisis is the failure to take responsibility. So we can't wait for others to take, re to take on responsibility. And uh, it's for everyone uh, to, to take direct action. So every organization, every individual in society should be questioning its actions and assessing its own sphere of responsibility. Um, so when we can do something, we have to do it. And we, when we can't, when it is outside of our control, we should try to influence others through our own examples with high standards and uh, hoping for the domino effects or investing in the domino effect. Um, so we need to, to take action and call for change, including in the humanitarian sector. So next slide. First of all, this has to start by uh, assessing and acknowledging the environmental impacts of aid. And uh, this is going beyond uh, climate change. It's also talking about the environmental uh, crisis, yeah, with loss of biodiversity, with pollution, chemical and biochemical pollutions. And um, from uh, the humanitarian perspective, we have to recognize that, um, yes, there are different impacts of humanitarian aid. And of course, uh, this is often viewed as secondary to the humanitarian imperative. And for long, it has been seen as secondary to the humanitarian imperative. But this has led to the repeated occurrence of en environmental degradation and destruction, which can impede then the recovery of affected and vulnerable populations and of communities who depend on natural resources and their ecosystem for their livelihoods. Um, so with long-term impacts on their lives and uh, on, on, on ecosystems. So there is an issue of accountability, the do no harm uh, principle for humanitarian action and sustainability, uh, trying to increase resilience and decrease dependency. So there are different categories of environmental impacts of aid, impacts uh, that are local, occurring at the place of the humanitarian operation, such as deforestation, to make space for settlement, and those uh, that are global, uh, for example, the uh, carbon emissions or the deforestation linked with unsustainable agricultural practices. Um, uh, impacts can be direct, uh, linked to humanitarian operations um, from offices or programs at field level, but they, are, they can be also indirect, coming from suppliers, for example, of service providers, um, or linked to the consequences of the operation. They can be in the short term, during the time frame of the project, and the long term. 
Um, and they can be, of, of course, cross sector, uh, such uh, for the logistics, the supply chain, and cash transfer programming, or they can be sector spe specific, uh, for example, for the shelter, the wash, or the health um, uh, sectors. Um, after that, after the assessment of the different uh, impacts, then uh, there are solutions. Solutions exist. And some organizations have started to measure and reduce their carbon footprint through travel policies, uh, basically less flights. Uh, Others are purchasing local goods or banning plastic bags, supporting recycling initiatives. These are only a few examples of what can be done. Um, of course, some of these initiatives will require investment, uh, but also will help contribute to savings. And in other cases, uh, there are no financial implications. Um, time to time, it will in, uh, imply technical expertise, but uh, this is not always necessary for implementation of some initiative. For example, a, a, travel, a green travel policy is not really technical. <laughs> it's only uh, uh, good, uh, good sense, yeah? Common sense, sorry. Um, of course, what is needed is uh, institutional and top-down support to strengthen and uh, sustain this initiative in the long term. But uh, we have to recognize that initiatives are blooming within organization and in particular from younger colleagues for which uh, uh, these issues are absolutely crucial uh, as a matter of coherence. Um, so we can consider these changes as new constraints or another incentives, finally, to move the sector towards localization and better links between humanitarian and development. And I would uh, uh, conclude by uh, saying that climate action is less a matter of developing solutions than finally accessing, implementing, and scaling that exponentially and sharing experiences, of course. Thank you so much, Monique, and also to Paul for um, setting um, the stage to talk in such a concise way. Um, let's deep dive into some of the aspects that you have just mentioned. So uh, we have all um, heard the news about the new IPCC report that was launched yesterday. And um, it, for the first time, it explicitly mentions um, such themes as uh, justice, historical responsibility, and colonialism. In fact, while I'm um, not such a big fan of overly simplistic content analysis, I've uh, scanned uh, the report and found uh, the term justice 14 times uh, in, in, in um, the, the summary report. And um, interestingly enough, the word humanitarian only two times, so there's a lot of things that we might have to discuss. Um, but let's jump into those um, systemic changes that you both have touched upon um, that also might mean questioning mandates and principles in a way. Um, do you, both of you, see uh, broader possibilities for humanitarians, for example, to rally behind climate justice initiatives? What, what does this mean, the connection between justice and what we have discussed, the severity of the crisis and the responsibility that both of you have mentioned? I think um, that's a a multi-dimensional question and difficult. Let me let me um, give a, just a couple of thoughts. Um, I mean, I think part of the the justice and uh, element is the idea of not about us without us, and you know this is an area where the humanitarian system has been consistently. I mean, I, I'm I'm not young, and I've been in the system for for most of my career. And when I was entering, we were having these conversations about accountability, about engagement, about the role of local actors, and we still are. Um, and if there's an area which is <laughs> maybe at last ready for, um, to the degree that justice is about balancing power, um, and uh, that, that would be, I think, one. So who's making the decisions and how are the decisions being made? Um, taking it from another angle, I think there is a very important justice question, which we probably are going to have to, as a sector, the humanitarian sector is going to have to consider 
um, how it approaches this. Humanitarian aid is discretionary. You know, the, the humanitarian system is based on really the degree to which uh, donor states and other private donors, and therefore the largely the taxpayers of the states, choose to give um, finance to humanitarian action. Um, it's a choice. It's not a right. It's not structured financially that way. Climate funding is very different. Loss and damage funding is very different. Um, it is based on the idea of uh, mutual but differing responsibilities under international treaties. How humanitarians engage with this discussion about the loss and damage financing, I think, um, you know, would be very important in terms of how humanitarians go about uh, either supporting or taking away from issues around climate justice. Um, it certainly is, on the one hand, something that humanitarians, you know, it intersects with humanitarian work so much, but it's not just another pot of money. It's not another pot of humanitarian money. So I think at those negotiation levels and in the everyday level of who's making the decisions, there are concrete things that we can do. Yeah. Yeah, this is clear that uh, the ones who did not participate to the global warming are the ones who are paid the highest price. So this is uh, the, uh, the issue at stake uh, when talking about climate justice. And uh, I agree, Paul, uh, the, the worst thing would be that uh, there won't be the one receiving at the end of the day uh, the loss and damage funds that we need to, to, to ensure. So I think that humanitarian actors have to think about what would be their role in, in this uh, financial system and ensuring that uh, this is, of course, there is a, a responsibility for humanitarian action to take part of some of our response. But uh, the issue is bigger than that. The issue is, uh, is uh, for governments, for communities first, uh, and then for humanitarian action to see where they can add value and bring something in, in a global uh, and, and much more inclusive, I would say, uh, uh, systemic change uh, that we need. Yeah. I know that it's not a very low hanging fruit to kind of uh, dwell on this um, um, on this level uh, a little bit longer, but please allow me to do so. Uh, well, you have mentioned uh, the issue of securitization and how what I would call this climate security nexus also um, threatens uh, humanitarian principles. Would you see um, this discussion, both of you? Would you see this discussion um, around justice and maybe um, engaging with those actors who are not um, who are not um, framed by humanitarian principles of neutrality and independence, um, endangering the principles in a similar way, or where is the difference? I think those principles are always up against the reality of what's happening on the ground. I mean, I don't think anyone here in this virtual conversation has ever actually been in a pristine humanitarian space. So it's, it's, a, it's a constant, um, there's a constant dialogue, constant negotiation of where and how humanitarianism fits into, as you're saying, a much bigger spectrum. We're, we're, we're a planet, we're not the sun in these crises. You know, we're often a very small planet. So how do we, how do we negotiate that? And I think many people are, are concerned, particularly many uh, humanitarians who deal with conflict um, are concerned that climate is going to developmentize and take away the humanitarian space. And it's very important that that obviously doesn't happen. Climate is reality. It's actually a reality which is happening first and worst in many conflict affected contexts. The humanitarian job on the ground at a policy level, I think is to try and ensure that the humanitarian principles are maintained where required in this broader constellation of actors. I don't think it's an either or zero sum game. I think like it's a it's a matter of negotiation. Yeah. That's actually a very good point. Um, would you like to add on that? Yeah no I, I recognize um, the value of humanitarian principles but we have to to come back to the very the sense of them, yeah, they were set up 
for external actors to cross lines during a conflict. Is it relevant then to try to apply them for the public policy about uh, disaster management? I don't think so, yeah? But there are other principles of, uh, of course, uh, humanity can apply to other kind of uh, policies, um, non-discrimination, uh, reciprocity, trust, things like that would apply for partnerships, uh, but uh, humanitarian principles have to be used for what they were supposed to be used, I would say. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, before uh, we will open up the panel to our distinguished external and, and on-site guests, I would like to encourage everyone uh, in the online audience to post comments and questions. And uh, maybe let's have one uh, small round on um, an important issue, the money issue that we have uh, touched upon already that, that connects to power, decision-making power and the long overdue localization efforts in, in the sector. Um, from the side of the humanitarian donors, do you see, uh, from your experience, a coherent response um, to the threats that climate change poses at the moment? What are you, some of your experience in that regard? Maybe the one you can think. Yeah, well, what we have to recognize first is that there are many efforts already done, I would say, and from developmental uh, actors that are funding also climate change adaptation and uh, and uh, and from humanitarian donors, uh, of course, we are starting to to reach uh, plateau. Yeah, the, 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 the increase of funds is not enough to to cover the gap uh, of increased needs. Uh, so. So there are issues, but there are also innovative uh, financing through assurance initiatives that are uh, uh, being implemented and uh, that are interesting, I would say. Um, but uh, yes, there is, a, there is an issue of uh, finance, of course, uh, uh, with regard to the level of needs. Um, Paul, you want to... Yeah, I think I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'd be interested to know what, what, what um, our expert guests and, and, and um, uh, participants think about this. But I mean, I think, I think it's not a coherent response, but it's a positive response, broadly positive. I think the positive bits of it are there is definitely focus among some donors. Um, Germany, for example, is a, is, is a good example. Um, there is a movement in the general direction of more flexible funding in terms of funding that can be allocated in the basis of context on the ground and to a degree longer term funding. And both of those are critical, I think, for, for, for any kind of thoughtful, useful and powerful response to, to climate emergencies. Um, less good, perhaps, on getting money directly to the front line, um, but... There's been, you know, some work around the country-based pool funds have been quite effective uh, in that. So some movement in that direction. So there's a lot that's positive. There is also some things that I think are not working so well from the donor side. Um, they are perhaps a an over focus on sort of magic bullets or certain kind of things that are. If we do this, we will solve climate change rather than perhaps a, a more general, how are we going to deal with all of the different elements, with how are we going to put the mitigation piece, the response piece, the resilience piece, how are we going to put all these together? Uh, I think that's not quite working yet. And finally, I think we have to recognise that the donors are not just humanitarian donors, they are climate donors and their development donors as well. And we need, to, I think, to... to represent the donors very strongly that humanitarian funding or climate funding, you know, they shouldn't be taking it from one pot to put it into another pot. Um, that the whole funding architecture and the amounts of funding going to climate, to humanitarian development uh, are going to need to increase because we are entering a world that humanity has not been in before. Like everything else, the money is going to have to change. Yeah.
I think you touched upon a very important point, especially here in Germany. People are very worried about um, the increased military spending now in the context of the crisis is uh, going um, uh, to, to take away exactly this kind of funding for uh, um, countering the negative effects of climate change. Thank you so much for um, setting the stage. Uh, before I will invite Bruno and Antoine, um, I would uh, really love to engage the audience for a second time. Um, as I've said, looking at uh, our registrations. We have seen people from a very diverse audience, from humanitarian organizations, but also from civil society organizations, double mandated organizations, other think tanks, from academia, and um, also ministries and donors who are um, present in the, um, in the chat. So um, I would like to encourage you all to um, answer the following questions. Um, the first one would be, how well prepared is the humanitarian sector to adapt to the challenges posed by climate change? And the second would be, how well prepared is your own institution? Um, not only humanitarian organizations, but every, uh, all the other uh, organizations I've just mentioned to adapt to the challenges um, posed by climate change. And it's already going quite well. It's quite fascinating. Um, and it leans towards yeah. yeah, still very dynamic, but I think there is a yeah, somewhat of a, of a battle between. <laughs> Uh, relatively well and not well. So I think what we can um, definitely see that uh, a very small amount of people have uh, ticked the box off uh, very well um, with um, balanced uh, uh, input towards relatively well and not well at all. So I think there's um, a lot of things that we have to discuss. So um, um, a lot of things that are not already um, spelled out and why so that are not hanging uh, up in the air. So um, I would like to take the opportunity to um, engage with our on-site guests, Kulana Kreidler and uh, Tom Hüsser. I uh, would like to start with you, um, Corinna. Uh, Corinna Kreidler is an independent consultant who has worked on humanitarian assistance for more than 20 years now, mainly on topics of humanitarian financing. Um, in her private capacity, she's particularly interested in climate crisis-related politics and also activism. Um, so the topic of this debate resonates both professionally and personally with her. Corinna, um, with reference to German policies and the new uh, foreign policy agenda of the new German government, you have touched upon questions about the future relationship, for example, between um, development assistance and humanitarian aid. Um, would you mind elaborating um, on that a little bit for us? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, maybe for the audience that's not so familiar with the recent changes in um, German government and German politics, so we have a new uh, coalition formed of the Social Democrats, the Green Party and the Liberals um, that took office end of um, 2021. And we have a Green Party uh, representative as our new foreign minister. We have the former minister of uh, the environment being now the minister of development. And we have also a Green Minister of the Economy, and that represents really a new and interesting um, setup at, that, that promises of hopefully more coherence. Um, we've also um, recently learned that the Foreign Minister appointed the Chief Executive of Greenpeace International as the most imminent uh, person dealing in the Foreign Office with uh, former. Uh, with former external climate politics. So activism kind of has joined the German government at very high levels. So I find this really, really interesting because it sort of asks questions, how does that, will that be translated into operational ways? And Paul, you, you, you mentioned a policy coherence, that's one thing. How does that translate into um, collaborative practices between the institutions on the government side? I think is a really interesting question we are going to look at. But also, what does that mean for us as humanitarian actors? How do we have to adjust? And do we have to leave our comfort zone? And I really liked your comments um, uh, on the on the humanitarian principles, because sometimes the, the principle of independence and neutrality can also be a bit of a, a comfort zone thing. So we have nothing to do with all of these politics because uh, we have our principles. And I think these new challenges um, ask 
questions and we can no longer sort of uh, just take this very um, uh, comfortable position. Personally, I must say, I have always been very skeptical about the whole of government approaches, especially when it comes to stabilization. But when it comes to climate change, I'm totally excited by this whole of government approach because I think the magnitude, and Paul, you introduced it so well, the magnitude of the challenge requires nothing less than a whole of government approach. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think this is a very, very important point that I would like to uh, discuss all with, the, with all of you. Um, specifically, the, the ADAPT um, um, papers mentioned the, the salarization around climate action, claiming that um, humanitarian actors do not work very effectively uh, with other stakeholders um, from civil society, from science, from, from, from other um, stakeholder groups, also climate activist groups, um, the private sector, and last but not least, obviously, the, the development sector. Um, um, in your view, uh, of this, this, uh, this goes to the whole panel. Um, is this a chance for also a renewed discussion uh, about new ways of working and what does it practically need to not only talk about new ways of working, but actually kind of um, setting uh, the world to um, this new way of working for a whole of government approach? Do you have some idea on that? Maybe I can step in from the from the Netherlands side from Kuno's platform for knowledge, humanitarian knowledge exchange. It's twelve humanitarian organizations, six knowledge institutes. Mm -hmm. I think uh, our our members have put uh, really see climate change and, and humanitarian action as, as a game changer. Has have put it on the agenda for this year as the first priority. But one of the things we want to do is really find out what it means in practice because. It's, it's good to see all these uh, intersections on paper, but how, what does it mean in practice? So what we at the moment aim to do is have four, uh, four meetings with humanitarian practitioners. But the first one will not be with, with humanitarian practitioners so much, but with the leadership of all organizations. Because we think it's very important that the leadership is on board. Otherwise, everybody does a lot of efforts and then it disappears somewhere in the organization. So of the four meetings, the first meeting will, will be with the leadership. The second meeting will be on greening our own activities, our own organizations, both as organization and as uh, and programmatic. That will be the second uh, uh, meeting. The third one will be, and there, I think there the Dutch organizations have quite some experience already on disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation, uh, greening the environment. There's quite some experience already there, but that will be the third meeting. And then the fourth meeting coming back to how does this change our way of working? That will be the, the meeting on what does this mean in practice? What do all these new concepts mean in down on the ground? What does it really mean? And of course, it will be uh, it means something for humanitarian funding, certainly. That's in the Netherlands is at the moment still separated, I would say, from, from water funding. Although there's big efforts from our government to, to, to connect it, but it's not so easy in practice. So this will be the fourth, fourth meeting uh, that we envisage uh, and that we're setting up now. Thank you, Ton. Uh, before we uh, move on, um, please allow me to introduce yourself mm -hmm. and to give you a proper introduction. Ton Häuser is an independent consultant and member of the steering committee of the Platform for Humanitarian Knowledge and Exchange, also known as Kuhn, as you have already mentioned from the Netherlands. Um, and Ekja and Kuhn has made the uh, climate change uh, strategic priority for 2020. So uh, maybe let's uh, dwell on that uh, point a little bit more and also with re regard maybe to something that was um, said earlier uh, because of the severity of, 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 of the crisis and um, the level of effectiveness that kind of combines that, that, that now all of a sudden the global north is affected by this kind of crisis. And I would, I would actually um, think uh, in a more hopeful or, or um, um, positive way that instead of... Um, the attention going away from the global south to the global north because of being affected, um, us, this us being affected ourselves, there might also be a chance for empathy or for understanding what being in a crisis might be um, 
what, what people have been going through, living through uh, for past decades and maybe even centuries. So um, would you see um, this also as an, an, an opportunity to, um, to differentiate the discussion around climate change from other discussions that the sector has uh, been seeing for the past uh, decades? <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, I think it is. It is an opportunity in many ways to to, to have new conversations. Um, I think it's imperative. You know, if we have the same people in the room, people like me, we will have the same conversations. Um, as, as as Veronique said, we need a much bigger tent. We need the voices of, of people who have different knowledge, um, better knowledge of what to do on the ground. Um, and so, so yeah, I think there is there is that definitely that possibility for for kind of a, a bit of a reset, a bit of a changing of the boundaries, um, just by incorporating different people in the conversation. I'm less hopeful. We have an expression in German that says actually "nach mir die Sintflut," which means sort of "after me the deluge," but literally we mean "I couldn't care less" because that's something sort of it does it's not my business. And I'm a bit worried that we will actually apply that sort of thinking to and, and you mentioned it with the us first um, approaches that we are even stronger more strongly closing our borders sort of thinking that we need our money for making our own towns safe and building higher dams in uh, the north coast of Germany instead of somewhere in the, in the global south. If, if I may, I mean, I think that's entirely, that's a legitimate concern. The one, one thing I think that's useful to, to bear in mind is going to be is the currency of knowledge as well as the currency of money. Um, in as much as one of the leveling effects of climate change may well be that those organizations, civil society, governments, NDMAs in the global south who just know a lot more about how to do these things, their power in the conversation has increased because they're going to be teaching us. So that may, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen, but there may be a leveling effect there. Yeah, I would say that the COVID pandemic was a good uh, example of uh, such systemic crisis and that we have still to learn from this uh, experience altogether, I would say, and as institutions. Um, I think that uh, it is an example of the kind of disaster we'll have to face in the future. And I'm not sure we've learned all what we could uh, yet from this experience. Uh, from what does that mean in, term, in terms of uh, working more with local organization, exchanging experiences, going from a very vertical system to much more horizontal uh, 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 and mutual aid, I would say. And um, we did a, a research uh, uh, in Paris uh, about um, the, uh, the role of humanitarian organization dealing with uh, people in the streets during COVID-19 pandemic. And it was really interesting to, to see the international humanitarian organization, organization looking for their added value uh, to interact with social actors and other uh, kind of actors dealing with the situation. And I think this is a real uh, laboratory uh, for humanitarian action um, to, to, to better understand what is the real added value of humanitarian actors in a such systemic crisis where all actors from a society have to do something and how to interact, um, how to exchange experiences, how to find the right place, mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, I think that there are still quite a lot of things to learn from the, this experience as as a yeah as a, an example of this kind of systemic uh, crisis we uh, face. Yeah, this is actually a very good bridge also to uh, um, um, as an aspect 
that uh, we wanted to touch upon before we jump to um, chat questions. Um, and this is uh, the networking activities that Rade and also Timo is uh, going to implement. Maybe um, let's give the audience a, a better picture of what, what does it mean with what kind of actors um, um, are you dealing with? Yeah, well, uh, it, is a, uh, it is a network we set up uh, on what 10 years ago with a group of uh, French NGOs, or let's say with a group of French uh, humanitarian workers within French NGOs that were really keen to work on the environmental impact uh, of humanitarian aid and greening, the greening aid part of the, of the issue. And uh, we've been facilitating discussions, exchanges of uh, experiences, uh, peer learning, let's say, uh, for the last 10 years. And uh, last year, or the, in 2020, we, we launched a, a commitment, a collective commitment to reduce uh, by 50% uh, our greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, which is what the IPCC uh, and the Paris Agreement uh, are, uh, is uh, asking for everybody and for all organizations. So we are working on that, and uh, so we have started to, to, to again to exchange about how to measure the, um, um, the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, how to reduce them, and, uh, and we ought to continue on this, uh, on this journey. Yeah. Would you like to add something about your initiatives? Yeah, you know, you know, we exist since 2017, so it's 12. NGOs, that is, some of them are a uh, member of, of a big alliance, like, like Save the Children or Oxfam or, or, or CARE. Some are really Dutch NGOs that are already uh, working from the Netherlands. We have also on board six knowledge institutes, five from universities and one from uh, uh, the Klingendal, the International Relations Institute in the Netherlands. Um, yeah, so, so that's us, and um, wait, I, I forget, you wanted me to, to because we're on, on the climate change, we're really at the beginning of, of what we are doing, yeah, so there's not so much to, to exchange there. What I think, what has been strong uh, from the, uh, the Kuna side is that over the years we've been able, in our meetings, and that was, uh, um, that was prompted even more by, by the COVID pandemic because we have all had to go online. That it was very well, well possible to, to involve many people from all around the world and, and um, uh, southern networks from Asia and Africa as well. So I think there the work has changed a lot. How are we going to do that in, in this topic? Because we really also want to have face-to-face uh, -face meetings again. So we're still looking into how are we going to do that uh, this time, but uh, certainly the over the last few years we have been able to, to work with a lot of uh, southern organizations and southern networks especially. Yeah. 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 Just to compliment, um, so when uh, we started, as I said, it was a group of uh, individuals, but now they are um, the leaders of the organization are taking uh, their responsibility and entering into a much more, uh, uh, I would say, uh, um, uh, engage uh, commitments and, uh, and uh, I think that uh, you're right, the question of leadership is absolutely key um, uh, but on this specific issue, as I said earlier in the presentation, I think that uh, there are ideas and uh, um, uh, dynamics within the organizations coming also from the not only top management, but also from the bottom up. Yeah, and this is something interesting to capture, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a it's a game changer. In so yeah, it's something interesting to support. So we would be most happy to exchange with Kuno mm -hmm. about this experience. Yeah. And I think now it's a, it's a good point to include the audience. Ralph will kick us off with uh, um, some insights on what's been going on in the chat, and then we can um, hopefully include a lively debate with the audience. Please Thanks, Andrea. I'm happy to do that. Um, the chat has been pretty lively, uh, long comments in the chat, so I won't read all of them and uh, wouldn't encourage 
uh, everybody to read it. But uh, maybe as a heads up, um, there has been a lot of talk about what we discussed as an integrated whole of government approach with critical points also from the audience uh, about its potential limitations. Uh, maybe as a heads up to, to Marc Dubois, I would encourage him to switch on his camera and share his comment in a, in a second while I uh, might elaborate a bit on, on the other ones in this arena. MSF has shared the question on, um, well, aren't there also risks uh, related to integrated funding, less side of funding from the humanitarian perspective, um, of course. And maybe, Paul, you could elaborate a bit on what, what's the issue you see with the style of funding and with the lack of humanitarian funding related to climate issues, but also if you see these risks and how they could be mitigated, uh, um, maybe. Um, there has been, uh, Stephanie Kuchmann has raised the question, do we need a strong regional focus in the future on where to provide humanitarian assistance um, for issues of really having the right impact, um, as she's shared in, in um, uh, the chat. Um, uh, as we might target the most relevant uh, environmental issues, so for example, in terms of deforestation, um, uh, in terms of where we will have very limited funding. So how do we target the funding which uh, might, might remain? And Mark uh, Dubois, um, I hope you could hear us, and there he is already uh, on the side, has asked the question, yeah, it might be a game changer, climate change for humanitarian action, but might we change the game in the wrong direction? But um, I'm sure Mark can elaborate much better on that um, than me, if that works now. Can you switch? On? Yes, I, I had to unmute my camera. Can you hear me now? Yes, excellent. Oh, well, uh, thank you for uh, pulling out that question. And, and thank you, Paul, Veronique, and, and everybody there who's, who's organizing this very interesting discussion. I guess... <clears throat> The humanitarian sector has, has done quite a good job over time of not engaging in transformation, but sort of absorbing um, attempts at transformation and turning them into mild tweaks. And I guess I wonder, you know, one would be sort of the, the humanitarianization of the efforts to to work against the climate, uh, to, to work against climate change. In other words, what what happens if you take uh, you know, a, a simplistic uh, uh, delivery of assistance to uh, alleviate symptoms, and you lose th that perspective uh, of getting down to the root causes. And that's something humanitarian action is quite geared to do. And there's a logic to it when you've got supposedly a development sector that's working on the deeper stuff. So that's the basic question. Do you, do you risk game-changing environmental relief to, to, to you know, the, tackling climate change to environmental relief. And second, the second part of that would be the, the humanitarian alibi that allows humanitarian action to mask political inaction on conflict. What happens if it does the same thing for the environment? So it's, it's kind of the same question about the, the power of the humanitarian sector to uh, create the impression of action when it's really not doing very much, especially when, if you look at the underlying symptom, uh, underlying causes and drivers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. So maybe let's take um, those three questions that um, I have seen. I will repeat uh, them, um, but maybe the, the, the two formal ones, but maybe let's uh, jump directly into um, Mark's uh, comments on um, humanitarian alibi. I invite everyone in, in the panel to, uh, to react and respond to that or to uh, discuss thoughts and ideas on um, it's a very political question on um, the risk games and, and um, technical technical fixes versus political fixes, if I might wrap it up like that. Please. Well, I think it's a question of, of sensibly sharing the burden and dividing roles and responsibilities. And maybe the sort of hardcore humanitarian actors are not the best place to address the root causes, and then they shouldn't. And this, what I try to express, sort of bringing really the experts into key government functions and joining forces, I think is a, is a new opportunity here. And because that we, we don't need to stay apart because of our sacrosanct principles, but we can engage um, changes the, the nature of the collaboration. and. Um, I think it's still a question of who does what the best, 
but in, in a different way of, of having a, a, a common goal and, and really joining forces. I think with this um, comment on experts is um, also opening up a broader space to discuss because um, maybe in comparison to um, other uh, domains that are uh, areas of humanitarian um, intervention, um, you can rely on experts whose data is more objectifiable in a way. So we, we have seen it with the report yesterday, there is um, um, a, a truth and an objective truth, truth around uh, climate change that um, um, cannot be so easy, um, easily um, politicized in a way or taken uh, and turned around in a way. So maybe that's also... But well, certainly can be politicized, sadly, as we've seen, and I think we can probably expect to see a lot of political pushback in a lot of places. But uh, I, I think Mark's comment is a really good one. Um, it's just a point of view, just an opinion from my side, of course. Um, I'm not too worried about that because I think the, the, the challenge is so big and the humanitarian system is actually not that big you know it's not it's not it's not such a big player we listen to each other but i'm not sure anyone else really does um, if we don't get it right people are not going to allow themselves to just die um, they will do everything they can and there are other actors the international financial institutions are getting very involved in these discussions uh, governments who are not necessarily supportive of the humanitarian system Uh, are getting involved in these discussions in other ways. So I don't think it's it's a question of us, of the humanitarian system, be leading the discussion or leading people into, into one place or another, so much as the choice that humanitarians have as to how do we wish to engage in the small part, as you're suggesting, the small part that we have to play. Um, because it is a small part, and it is a very important part, because for the... The, the poorest and most marginalized people, as the IPCC report suggested yesterday very clearly, um, it's too late for mitigation. You know, there are there, people are going to need response, and all of the mitigation in the world, we've already passed the point where that alone is going to save people's lives and livelihoods. Thank you. Yeah, just to complement, I think this is. The same kind of discussion we have been having for the last 20 years about the humanitarian development nexus and links. Yeah. So it depends also on the, what do we understand, how do we uh, understand or uh, yeah, spell out uh, our mandate as humanitarian organization? Is it only to respond to symptoms? For some organizations, it is clear, yes, it is. Or other, there is a, a search for sustainability of impacts, so they, they are going beyond the really short-term response. So it's for me, it's the same kind of discussion we are having. And I would say that maybe the response should come from outsiders. What is your added value? Where do we need you as expert of dealing with disasters to get better prepared? to maybe pre yeah, prepare and anticipate uh, risk. So, yeah, I think this, um, this the ideal response should come from uh, uh, other actors than humanitarian one, local ones asking for support for some technical issues that they may uh, uh, be interested in, yeah. Before I would like to invite maybe a second round of um, audience, online audience uh, comments and questions and maybe even someone who would like to uh, join us on the screen. Um, maybe let's um, um, dive into uh, the, the two questions that have been uh, asked before about the one about the regional focus on where to provide um, um, humanitarian assistance. Is this maybe a practical, a more practical approach to 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 um, And the uh, climate crisis, and uh, the other question, if I remember right, was an MSF question related to um, the risk related to um, integrated funding for humanitarian um, um, action. So, um, the first one who goes gets the uh, opportunity to choose <laughs> uh, which question um, is there to answer. Um, Now, maybe on this, on this risk of integrated funding, I'm, I'm not sure about the funding, but of course, as Kuna, we have members that 
uh, many are multi-mandated organizations, double-mandated organizations. There's only two that are, I would say are really only focusing on, on humanitarian uh, immediate uh, needs. So I think they're both uh, yeah, very, very needed. Uh, so I think that it's very important to have also this capacity of, of reacting immediately without all the root causes and without taking everything. To, I mean, this crisis around Ukraine, in Ukraine, uh, proves that, that we need now people who can immediately be uh, there and, and support refugees, etc. So then there's, there's a, a whole way of working after that that, that needs indeed the, all the local knowledge and all the integrated knowledge of, of climate change and, and humanitarian action. So I wouldn't see it as a danger integrated funding as long as there's as we save the capacity that when disaster, a big disaster strikes, that we can react immediately without, without every, all strings attached. Yeah. Yeah. Any thoughts? But I think there are new ethical questions coming. If I'm sort of comparing what's more important to save the Amazonian forest, because we know it, it will sort of contribute a big share to and uh, slowing down climate change versus spending money immediately on climate related migration, for example. And I don't think we have the tools to make those judgments. Um, we know there are big trade offs there. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm just putting the challenge mm -hmm. out sort of how to find ways, knowing we have a principle of impartiality, but how does that apply when we are comparing a forest with a group of? Yeah, climate uh, related uh, migrants, for example. I think that's fascinating. Um, I hadn't thought of that, but I, uh, I think it's fascinating. I think the, the anticipatory action movement in another way is also forcing humanitarians to think about what are the trade-offs and the relative importance of now versus tomorrow, you know, of, of present life versus future life, albeit in a slightly different way. Um, so all of these things are challenges to, to if you like, the you know, humanitarian way of thinking. But isn't that a good thing? You know, for a new future, don't we have to be, be challenged and see how the principles work in this future? I don't think it's a risk. Um, it might be an opportunity. The risk is that we don't, you know, we, we leave the conversations to everyone else. If I may, if Dakar, the former Secretary General of the ICRC had once said, I'll never sacrifice a life today for saving a life tomorrow. And I think that sort of paradigm, how do we translate that into climate change and its challenges? We are, we are not equipped for it yet. But I particularly like the idea of um, taking it as an opportunity rather than um, rather than um, a, 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 a constant threat to it mm -hmm. to actually leave maybe also our comfort zone. Um, Ralph, um, could you um, update us on um, other? Sure. Um, uh, still, the uh, chat really lively and really raising a lot of big questions, and we can't touch on all of them. I think it's about uh, humanitarian coordination, but should be reformed about uh, political will. How it could. Uh, we created after decades of limited humanitarian reforms and where could this come from? But maybe touching a bit on um, what we just discussed, uh, Matthias from Malteza, for example, shared the point where the discussion on political responsibility shouldn't distract us from taking action ourselves and reform our own organizations. So might it be also be abused as an excuse not to act um, ourselves? Um, but of course, this uh, can come as we just touched on already with a conflict of interest and goals. Um, for example, in terms of uh, where do we uh, invest our funding and which operations, but also a conflict of interest. Like, for example, Stephanie Koopman has shared donors must stop counting impact by cost to life touch data. Then the organi organizations would have the time and the money for actual social and environmental friendly or regional, local procurement, um, which might come as a higher cost sometimes. We might need to invest, for example, in carbon-free engagement as a think tank, as a humanitarian organization, but it might come as a higher cost so we can provide less humanitarian assistance. So how do we deal with this conflict of goals? Um, and uh, do we need to take an approach um, while we save as many lives and provide as much assistance today, but we might uh, extend the course of humanitarian 
threats to uh, lots of people in the midterm and in the long term. Uh, how do we balance that? Uh, Veronique can share your experience from your, your network and uh, you on this uh, the questions. Yeah, thank you. Well, many questions. Uh, let's uh, talk about the issue of uh, investment to greening aid. Uh, in fact, what comes from the studies and the different uh, research we've done on that uh, is that some changes may require more funds. That's right. And some will not. <laughs> so at the end of the day, there will be also savings. So um, there is, there is a, a need for donors to accompany changes and to, in some cases, for example, accept that indeed it will cost uh, more to purchase local goods. But in other cases, it will uh, be less money. So um, I think it's difficult to have a global response to this question. But uh, the only thing we can say is that we need donors to embark as humanitarian organizations have to embark, they have to embark also uh, to make change happen in, in the end of the day. Yeah. But there are discussions uh, taking place uh, right now, and we know that DJ is moving, um, Germany, I think, also, French government is moving in this direction, yeah? taking the, their responsibility, uh, but asking also humanitarian organizations to, 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 to embark also. So, yeah, there is no simple question to this complex, <laughs> no simple answer to this complex, complex question. Yeah, I think uh, the, the thing of greening our actions is, is hinging not so much on the, on the donors. I think it's hinging very much on ourselves. We have to make up our minds how we want to work, how we want to green up the organizations. I have the feeling that at least in the Netherlands, the donor will follow. And, and certainly private donors will like us to work that way. So it's also changing our way of working, We're not flying so much anymore, but we had a good exercise over the last two years to recover, we couldn't fly that much anymore. So there are possibilities to work in a, in a whole different, or a whole different, but in a different way. So I think it's much up to us. I think there are many possibilities to do it, but uh, it takes a lot of uh, thinking and, and also putting it into practice, it's also a bit uh, tedious sometimes. You, have, you need to make new regulations for yourself, what you do, how you do it, instead of working the way you always did it. So uh, it's much up to us. Yeah. And maybe at this point, um, Karina Lehmann could switch on her camera um, because um, she shared um, the perspective uh, pretty early in the discussion on greening aid, what might be the priority and what we really need to look at. Um, as we discuss how we could read our own operations or activities. So if Karina is um, with us and would be happy to share the point in person, maybe we allow her to discuss this ICRC perspective. Otherwise, of course, I'm happy also to read her point. No, there she is. No. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm trying to find my camera. Hello, hello, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, I, um, of course, as, as always, I'm, I'm, I'm not here representing ICRC. That's, uh, that, that's what, what, what we say, but in a private capacity. Um, no, I found it interesting, uh, uh, of course, everything you said. And uh, I think there was another colleague who shared this recent um, publication on the new humanitarian. And that really turned out, and I found it really interesting that um, while, of course, it's it's very correct to focus on on, on flights and, and reducing of, of carbon footprint that way, uh, if effectively our carbon footprint stems predominantly from uh, our supply chain, and uh, and and that I think is, is is interesting to to first look at the facts and then take it from there um, the, uh, the 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 accord and action. 
And there, of course, uh, an action that has been taken, fortunately, by many human hand actors, not only ICRs, is to switch from uh, in-kind, for instance, relief, um, when we think of uh, ECOSEC interventions, in-kind relief to cash assistance. So, so that, of course, not only is important in the sense of um, empowering the affected populations, so they have a choice to buy what they deem right, but, of course, it also uh, improves our carbon footprint instead of shipping over the world certain goods, um, we, um, we avoid that and by that also enhance the local market. Of course, this is not possible everywhere. Where there is no local market, the money doesn't help. Um, but in most contexts, we have really shifted from in-kind uh, donations to cash assistance. Um, and uh, a positive side effect is a bit... Um, a certain reduction, of course, in, on the carbon footprint. So uh, I, I guess my point was really to, to highlight that it's worthwhile to, to really uh, thoroughly assess the data and the basis in terms of, okay, where is really our, our contribution and, and to, then to adjust operations um, accordingly. Does any of you want to share some thoughts around that? Um, otherwise, I would um, maybe ask a question that actually I'm, I'm, I'm taking um, my, my, my position and hopefully not abusing it too much, but um, I'm thinking around also urban crisis and the urbanization uh, um, uh, um, tendency. Um, yesterday we have heard that um, cities are the hotbeds of, of climate change and um, there is also some movement within the sector to uh, properly address uh, humanitarian challenges within urban contexts, uh, specifically uh, around the Red Cross. And I am actually wondering um, if you have any thoughts on uh, um, on how um, humanitarians can better tackle those those those, those crises within cities, having in mind that that um, um, cities are not only um, the places where where uh, the, the climate crisis is, is 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 getting worse because of the emissions, because of the densely overpopulation, but also um, uh, uh, higher challenges on. on uh, creates higher challenges for, for um, um, humanitarian action in and of itself. Um, or do you have any thoughts on that? I'm sure you do. Yes, I'm not sure they're very good ones. Um, no, but I mean, you are, you're certainly right. I, I think that a, a lot of the focus of uh, climate-related activity as the focus of conflict-related activity increasingly um, is going to be urban because that's where the people are and because there are certain drivers, conflict drivers around asymmetrical warfare, climate drivers around migration, around population density, around reliance on water and other services. They're going to mean that certain urban populations are very particularly vulnerable. Um, and I think the what's interesting there is there are so many problems. There's so many problems with that from a humanitarian perspective in terms of response. Um, just in terms of the density, in terms of the community, what is a community, who are you working with, really, how to, in terms of the, you know, all, all the multiple relations, multiple organizations, the, 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 the cost, the time cost of working with all of these different actors becomes, becomes very high, all of that. Um, but it's also perhaps in the urban environment that some of the solutions or ways of working to climate um, are being developed. So not only are problems great in the urban environment, but might also be some solutions. Mike can ask there as well. I think this is about what you were driving at. Um, two things in particular. I think urban humanitarians increasingly in many organisations have been doing a really good job of looking at systems more effectively, at uh, much more systemic analysis of how all these things are connected and what happens if something goes wrong here, how is that going to relate? That, of course, is going to be useful in urban environments and climate, but it's useful for climate issues in general. The second, um, and uh, our colleague mentioned it just now, is, of course, cash and social protection. Um, 
we've seen, I think, over this very set, not sure really what's happened yet overall with COVID, but certainly in many urban environments, social protection has been very, very important. Humanitarian cash hasn't always been very good at linking into the social protection systems. Um, but it's it's a particularly powerful approach in cities where you know the markets may be functioning better, where people may have better access to technology, connectivity, and so on. And so I think some of the learning around cash, humanitarian cash and social protection, particularly from urban areas, is going to be very helpful. Uh, as we move forward with, with the climate challenge. Yeah, no, a few words on that. Uh, I think that, yeah, uh, cities more in other places are placed uh, where humanitarian actors have to coordinate uh, with uh, different kind of key players. And uh, there are, again, only one part of the response which has to be led by local authorities, by the social protection actors, uh, with the CSOs, etc. So, um, and, and I think that uh, this is a good example uh, to think about how to coordinate, maybe not sector-based coordination, or not alone, but area-based coordination with some local actors at the center, uh, of the of the response and the and the coordination, uh, so I think cities might be a good place where to think about uh, how to, to to better coordinate and uh, and implement localization. Really, uh, yeah. different kind of Thank you, Veronique. Um, I will now, um, before we close, um, invite um, our panel for a last final statement with takeaways from from from. Um, today's panel. I think we have covered a variety of very, very important um, aspects of uh, climate change vis-a-vis uh, -vis humanitarian change and um, I would just like to make a quick round to uh, give you the opportunity to say goodbye or so maybe just one takeaway. I think this this topic has, a, has the potential to be overwhelming and to sort of make us feel lots of powerless and, and really deflated and maybe just a, a plea sort of to concentrate on what we do well and to continue doing this well with a different broader perspective in mind and then sort of take it yeah step by step thank you yeah i had exactly the same in mind it's quite overwhelming so we should really pick what we where we can be effective where we can contribute and it's, it's particularly overwhelming in these days when all these issues around climate change play such an important role, where the Ukrainian crisis plays another important role that we cannot uh, that we cannot forget about. So it's yeah, it's a bit overwhelming, but I think there are certainly uh, things that we can do well. We can green ourselves. We certainly can play a role in climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. And, and then we have to see how far we can get and, and how much we can collaborate with, with others, with local organizations, with, with development actors. But there will, in a way, in a, at a certain moment, there will also be a, a stop to that, I think. Uh, we cannot do everything. Yeah. So, sadly, I think disasters are going to be increasingly a part of everybody's life or human life. Um, they get, so, they can be everybody's business. Um, you know, the, the idea that humanitarians have some sort of ownership over disaster, I think we're going to see that uh, dissolving. Um, and so for me, I think the common denominator of these conversations, many of these conversations today, have been in that situation, how are humanitarians, quite a small sector, going to position themselves uh, around larger crises, bigger problems, different actors? And that's that's question of choice. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a question of are we going to engage in those conversations? And critically, much more important than conversations, what are our organizations doing on the ground today? You know, what, what's, what's the thing, going, going to this point about the, the, the advantage, if you're working in the Sahel or, or Bangladesh or wherever, how can you best work to achieve your goals and work with the other actors through joint assessment and joint planning? Thank you. Yeah, maybe 
Yeah, I agree with all what you said, and uh, maybe I would uh, spell it uh, differently, but I think it's the same idea. Um, as I said uh, in my presentation, I think that the tragedy of the climate crisis is that uh, no one takes responsibility nowadays. Yeah, and how humanitarian organizations could not take responsibility, being witness of the impacts on the most fragile population. So, we have to take responsibility as a matter of coherence and uh, and and and, we, and 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 be part of the of the advocacy efforts uh, together with other uh, actors. And then, uh, on, on the operational uh, point of view, I would say that um, it might push humanitarian actors to find their right place where they are. A real added value, but recognizing that, yeah, the issue is bigger, bigger, bigger than us. Uh, of course. Yeah. Thank you so much. I would myself would like the opportunity uh, to to share a very very short quote I have actually read today uh, this morning prior to the event from one of the authors of the IPCC report um, saying targeting a climate resilient sustainable world involves fundamental changes to how society functions including changes to underlying values worldviews ideologies social structures political and economic systems and power relationships this might feel overwhelming as we for all um, discussed uh, just now at first, but the world is changing anyway. Climate resilient development efforts um, offers us uh, ways to drive change to improve well-being for all. And I think this uh, kind of sums it up anyhow. So it's uh, it, it's happening anyway, and we need to just jump on it and make the best out of it. With these words, I would like to, uh, to close today's events with a very, very heartfelt thank you to our guests who came to Berlin to be with us um, to discuss this uh, pressing issues and hopefully hands-on and hopeful ways forward also, because I think this is something that we all... Um, Need at the moment and um, those hopeful way forwards. Thank you so much, uh, Veronique. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Corinna. Um, many thanks also to our online um, audience for their great inputs and comments and the lively debates. And last but not least, um, certainly the biggest thank you um, is due to our chat team um, right in the uh, foreground and especially those people working tirelessly in the background who have done the lion's share to uh, actually make this event uh, uh, working. Um, Isabel Jusang, Raphael Ludwig, Anna Tritzler, Bede, Frank, Abrat, Sai, and thank you so much for um, providing us with such a great event. Thank you. Thank you.